All right, we're drawing very close now to Holy Week. That week with the, the pain of Good Friday and the surprising joy of Easter. And as we follow this path, we're going with Jesus and his friend, Simon Peter. Peter, like many of us, saw something that was just indescribable and inspiring in Jesus. Someone worth following even when we weren't sure where it might lead us. Now, Peter has been watching this teacher and healer change lives and change relationships. And like many of us, he has had to change his conception of God and what God is doing through this amazing person over and over as their relationship develops. Now, he had high hopes that this would be the Messiah who would lead a revolutionary movement to overthrow the Roman government. And as Colin mentioned last week, Jesus squelched that idea pretty quickly. This would not be a military movement. It would be a, a revolution of relationships. So now along with Peter, we're listening to Jesus talk about mending broken relationships. Now, I, I love this passage, yet when I read these instructions about, you know, talking to someone directly about how they've done something wrong and then telling a few more people and then taking it to the whole church community, I can think of so many ways this can go wrong. You probably can too. When emotions get heightened and egos get bruised, things can get very ugly. And I think as we read these, that's why it's important to pay attention to what has come before this lesson on conflict resolution. Before this, as we step back into the chapters ahead, Peter has been watching Jesus. He's been talking with all kinds of people, with insiders, with foreigners, with people who had been passed over as cursed by God, talking and healing men and women and children. And when the disciples argued over who would be the greatest, his answer was the one who becomes as humble as a child. Now, Pat Bennett, writing on spirituality and conflict, points out that here Jesus is describing the basic values and practices that distinguish this faith community from others. Values that include caring for one another as you would care for children includes avoiding anything that would cause others to stumble, caring for the most vulnerable in your community, and now forgiving without limits. This whole chapter challenges us to begin with ourselves, with honest appraisal of our own motives, with an appreciation of how maybe we contribute to some of the cycles of relational disruption and a willingness to notice and change any of our ways of thinking or speaking or acting that contribute to conflicts. Back in chapter five, Jesus suggested that when you are offering your gift to God, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave the gift there and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come back and give your gift. We put, could probably include, if you are singing praise songs to God and you remember that someone has something against you, reconcile that relationship before you come back and sing praises because there is nothing more important to God than our relationships with one another. So now after Jesus describes these steps in conflict resolution, Peter asks, well, how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? And He's probably thinking, I could see myself doing this once, but maybe twice, but you know, some people never change. So we suggest seven times, like that's reasonable. And Jesus probably recognizes that he's attempting to be generous with seven times, but still that's not close. It's 77 or seven times seven. Because it's not really about counting, it's about how many times someone's wrong, it, it's changing our point of view. Because we say we believe that God is forgiving and we are forgiven, but when someone hurts us or betrays us, we tend to lose that sense of perspective. I think we all share that common human flaw. We blame our own mistakes and failings on, well, there were circumstances. 
If I said something that hurt someone's feeling, I know that I didn't mean to hurt their feelings. Maybe I was tired, it was a bad day. I'm not a mean person. But when someone else does something that hurts us, we assume in their case, well, there's a character flaw involved. They meant to hurt me. I saw a meme this week on uh, Facebook said, when I don't respond to someone else's email, it's because I'm busy. When they don't respond to my emails, that means they hate me. <laughs> we have this tendency to skew our perceptions. When we really, really don't want to let go of our anger, we go back to saying, well, I know I make mistakes, but I would never do anything like that. And we kind of go back to those numbers games and try to figure out whose pain is worse and who's more deserving of punishment. Peter is asking, so how many times do I have to forgive and you know, stay good with God and feel good about holding on to a little bit of this bitterness and maybe not speaking to them again? Jesus is very understanding and also understands that we have the ability to make different choices if we're willing to look into ourselves more clearly. We can choose to have empathy, and maybe we need to make that a goal to increase our capacity to empathize with others, and especially those that we tend to disagree with. Another, another fun meme related to overthinkers. Overthinkers apparently make good friends because overthinking is associated with having empathy and being able to understand the feelings of others. So if you have been beating yourself up for being an overthinker, there's a good side to that because we can take the time to think about what's going on in the other person's life, giving a little direction to our overthinking, to think and to feel what this situation might look like or feel like from their perspective, through their eyes, as the saying goes, to walk in their shoes. And we can still disagree, but maybe do so with a little more understanding. So this brings us back then to our directives on conflict resolution. Before we step forward and confront someone else, we need to have worked on our own feelings. Fred Luskin suggests that first, we need to recognize what we feel, put words to that, our hurt, our anger, do we feel alienated, left out, and to acknowledge that our feelings might actually be related to memories from our past. We're experiencing them in the present, but maybe they have been made stronger because they trigger something from our past and then try to understand that the other person's point of view might be triggered by experiences in their past that lead them to see things different from us. Assuming there's a reason this person did what they did or said what they said, and try to figure that out and maybe ask some questions. It is helpful to speak up to say something about what is concerning us because holding our emotions in usually is going to make the problems worse in the long run till we let too many offenses build up and our emotions overwhelm us. But all of our grievances start with a situation maybe that didn't work out as expected. We had an experience where we didn't get something we wanted or something we needed for our own well-being. So if we try to begin to think about this confrontation with positive intentions, that may include expressing our unmet needs in maybe the, the clearest, most beneficial terms that we can. And as much as is in our power, seeking ways that this conflict can be resolved and relationships could possibly be made stronger. So we may want to start by considering what results we are hoping for. And that might make us a little more realistic about what we say. Are we looking for a chance to vent? That's probably not going to end well. Are we looking for an apology? That might be possible. It might not come in the way we want. Are we trying to make the other person just feel really, really guilty? Or do we hope to repair the broken relationship? 
Peter found Jesus' suggestions difficult to follow. He was hoping Jesus would just give him at least a limit to caring. But no, he doesn't give us a hall pass to hate. He keeps asking us to create a different kind of community. He wants us to mean what we say every week when we pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I hate that as word right in the middle. Could it be something else? But it calls us back again to forgive and to work on our relationships. So the end game isn't just resolving each particular conflict or getting to vent our anger. It's facing those conflicts while valuing our relationships, seeking to resolve our conflicts without completely severing relationships. Although we do recognize we need boundaries, and it is true that in our broken world, with our sometimes damaged psyches, we have to change the way that we relate to one another. There are times when we may find we can't live in the same house or maybe work in the same office, but we can continue to care about the welfare of the other person. We can forgive and hold out hope that they might make changes in their lives to reach their potential, to be happy and healthy wherever life takes them. And this seems difficult in our lives, <clears throat> but in many places more difficult than we can imagine. Desmond Tutu, Archbishop who oversaw the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa after years of war and apartheid, worked with people from both sides of a war, and he wrote that in these situations, it's not restoration of old relationships, but renewal of the relationship or release. He points out we can't make a carbon copy of the relationship we had before the hurt happened. Renewing our relationships is a creative act where we create a new relationship out of the suffering, one that is stronger for what we have experienced together. Or releasing a relationship is choosing not to have someone in your life any longer, but you have released your relationship only when you have truly chosen this path without wishing that person ill will. Forgiveness is difficult to do, but it is more painful not to do it. We realize more and more that many of our ongoing health issues can be connected to and exacerbated by our emotions and especially hanging on to anger and resentment. So in Jesus' challenging instructions, we are invited into the hard work of mending the whole world one relationship at a time. And David Lewis knows that this is when when read in this way, these verses are actually quite countercultural. We live in a culture of dehumanization, a culture where we can accuse and complain about someone else at a safe distance, commenting on posts. We can trash people's reputations on social media. We can share difficult news through an email rather than a face-to-face -face conversation. And in each case, we have failed to take seriously the humanity of the person in whom we are in a relationship. So Jesus is asking us to be direct and respectful in communication. If we are struggling with something that someone has said or has done, not to talk about it behind their back, not to stage a dramatic public confrontation, but to take Time to slow down, to acknowledge and process our own initial rush of emotions, and then to engage in dialogue with that person, one-on-one. -on -one. People don't change quickly, but we can change and we can grow and we can learn from one another. Together we learn God's truth that grace is at the heart of the universe, we are choosing to live into the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. 
So may mercy and understanding and forgiveness that makes room for change and growth, this is who we want to be. These are at the heart of the one that we follow. This is the only way we will know peace and the only way our world will know peace. So we will continue to follow this one in the weeks ahead. Now together, we'll sing. <laughs>